It's me. I was wondering if you were ready to learn some more about statistics and how we use it. We use it in our lives. Okay, I know I can't sing, but you guys got to give me some, send me some songs so that I have them ready. It took me about 20 minutes to find this song. But like I said, as we look at how statistics is used in our lives. So go to our notes, page 10. And I know your thoughts are, my page 10 doesn't look like this. Yep, I know. Whiteout is my friend. We talked about yesterday, I should say earlier today, the idea between left skewed symmetry and right skewed. But it also tells us a little bit more. Okay, as I look at this idea right here of left skewed, it's not just, yes, we have more data on the right, but mathematically speaking, when we start to look at some data, our average, that's what X bar represents, our average is going to be less than our median. So as we can see based on the little hash marks here. Now, these are the two that we compare the majority of the time, but since I have all three here, we can see here that our mean is less than our median, which is less than our mode. So our mode, which is the one that occurs the most frequently, is the highest when it is left skewed. A prime example of this is our, um, could be car sales. So the average of the car would mean you take a bunch of cars, add them together, and divide by the number of cars you look at versus the median price of a car. Well, the median price of the car here when it is left skewed is going to be greater than that when we just take the old school average. And this works perfectly when I am trying to sell a car. I'm going to go with the median price. But if I want to purchase a car, I'm going to go with, I'm looking for the average. Why? Because it's going to be less. Next, as I look at um, symmetry, with symmetry, please notice here, we have a beautiful bell curve that you know I didn't draw when you have the mean, the median, and the mode all approximately, squiggle lines, equal. And this is what the goal is, but it never really happens. Or I shouldn't say never, it rarely happens. Um, but that is always the goal. And I just lied. It does happen when you have a lot, a lot, a lot of data. Okay, now let's look at our right skewed here when the majority of our data is sitting here on the left. And we can see the order of things that we have here. We have the mode is going to be the least. The median is the middle um, um, in terms of our averages. And our mean is going to be the greater one. Again, in statistics, we pay attention more to this comparison right here because if I am asking you if something's left skewed or right skewed, you will have the data and be able to determine your mean and your median given, given to us by our calculator. But the mode, our calculator doesn't give us that. And honestly, in statistics, we don't pay attention to the mode that much either. Okay, so here is the quickie on just the, the three and what they represent, and these are AP questions waiting to happen. Next, I want to talk to you about, again, I use my Y out, bimodal, unimodal, and uniform distribution. Unimodal is what I just discussed, one hump. That's the best way of putting that. You, got just got, you have one hump going on. But as we look at this right here, bimodal, bimodal is exactly as it shows. Yes, we have more than one um, mode. Remember, a mode is going to be your average score. So here, as I look at it, when I have more than one hump, or I should say more specifically, when I have two humps, that's what bimodal looks like. The prime example that I can use of this is that if this is um, a, um, a preschool graduation, so remember preschool is two, three, and four. 
Well, we take the average of their um, ages, and their um, average age is going to go here. But then we have their parents. Their average age is represented here. So, but when we put it together, where is the overall average going to be? Somewhere here in the middle. But we can see because of the grade discrepancy, we can see how that would be considered bimodal. Next, and the last one I want to discuss right here, is the idea of uniform distribution. Okay? Uniform distribution is exactly what it looks like. So you tell me, what does that thing look like? Yeah. A rectangle or a square. And the best example I can give of that is a dice. All six sides have an equal chance of being, of being tossed. So that is a prime example of a uniform distribution. Now, whenever we are comparing distributions, remember, our bottom line is we have to look at our socks. We are looking at our, remember, this represents the shape, the outlier, the center, and the spread. And then when we do that, we have to compare it of the two sets of distribution, possibly three sets, but usually it's just comparing two. Um, like, for instance, I'll be comparing um, the distributions for, my, for the various classes as the semester goes on. I'll be comparing four distributions. Why? I have four classes. So when I'm comparing my distribution of grades, I need to put on my white socks. Honestly, no one cares the color, but putting on the socks. Which takes us to our next premise or next ideology here, histograms. Histograms we, is a pictorial represent, representation of data. And we use that, and this is the key here, we use a histogram for quantitative data and quantitative data only. So the one thing about a histogram, a histogram looks like this that I look, have right here. So it looks like a bar graph, but a histogram connects, a bar graph does not which takes me to my page 11, common mistakes when we are looking at histograms. Okay, first of all, don't confuse a histogram with a bar graph. As you can see, a histogram, like I said, the bars connect, and more specifically, this is for quantitative data, whereas a bar graph, the bars do not connect, but in terms of statistically speaking, what does that mean? Bar graphs are for categorical data. Next, when we are doing a comparison of distributions and the observations are a different amount, we might want to, we will want to use percentages instead of a count, which makes sense because if I'm comparing one distribution that has 100 people and another distribution that has 300 people, how do I have, isn't it going to look like my um, histogram on the 300 people is going to look a lot taller than that of my 100. And I'm sitting here going to try to do a comparison. I mean, how does that work? And yes, that's too fat. Okay, so, I'm sorry, you can't even see it, so let me clean that up. So the bottom line is that when we are comparing two distributions, in which, in which, in which, the number of observations are different. Now, if they're three or four different, no one cares. But if there's a big difference, yeah, that's not very good. Use percentages. The last um, thing that we need to be concerned about when it comes to histograms is, please remember, just because a graph looks nice doesn't make it meaningful. And the prime example that I have of that is this right here. Now, this is something I grabbed. At least you know it's not Fox News this time. Just kidding. No, no. Okay, so as I look at this, it's talking about our temperature is in Celsius, not Fahrenheit, which would be nice. And how much, um, how many bottles of sunscreen? Well, here it's saying it's pretty hot, and we have 10 bottles. Here we have 20 bottles. Again, these graphs are beautiful. But exactly what does it tell us? It kind of just basically tells us that, yeah, the hotter it is, the more sunscreen we use. But 
if I was an advertiser, I would want to know more than that. You know, more than, okay, yeah, it's more, but exactly how much more? No one knows. Okay, so I will see you guys tomorrow. And I wish I could sing that Adele song. Goodbye. It's me. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.